Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to our Sabbath school. We're here in Laguna Niguel broadcasting and for those that are online with us and for those uh, and happy with our congregation here present but also happy to have you with us online. Um, we have tonight in our panel Scott on my right and then we have David and I'm Danielle. So let's get started with a wonderful word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Father and the Holy Spirit, we come before you today to discuss the words that you have given us throughout the history and the commandments you told us to keep. Lord, we are in need of your help. As we discuss the word today, help us so that we can understand it, apply it, and others can be blessed from your word, Lord. It is your blessing that is upon us and upon the whole earth, and we praise your name for your blessing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we are in this entire quarter we've been studying in the book of Deuteronomy, and uh, Deuteronomy has been an exciting book in the past um, Maybe years ago, I always thought of it sort of a dreary, sort of mm, a, a book kind of laws. Mm -hmm. But we've started studying a little bit on touching on Deuteronomy earlier in the year, even the previous quarter. And it's just like it started coming alive for me mm -hmm. and for us as a church as we've been studying. And now, as we're getting deeper and deeper, it's just becoming incredibly meaningful to us today. So our lesson today is lesson six. And it is titled, For What Nation Is There So Great? At first, I was a little bit baffled by this title. It's like, and what great, great nation is there that has such statues and righteous uh, judgments um, is what the text is. So let's look a little bit at the memory text. Memory text today is in Deuteronomy 4 with 8. And it reads, and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Now, what makes a nation great generally from our experience is uh, what it achieves in political power, conquered lands, exploits in war, or its wealth, for example. So this rhetorical kind of question that Moses put in the beginning of this book um, is actually a statement that implies that this nation he's talking about, the Israelites, is the greatest nation on earth. What great nation is there such as this type of a thing, question. So when we, I was kind of sitting back and thinking a little bit at the Israelites and who were they? I mean, they were slaves previously in Egypt. They have been plucked out of this land. They were wandering nomads without a land. Uh, just this, this picture of a great nation just doesn't seem to come together for me. Mm -hmm. um, but then we read a little bit further and we try to understand what it is that made this Israelite nation great. What what is it? it? It was not exactly what they did. It wasn't exactly who they were. It was God that made them great. And as the title states in this lesson, we explore what made Israel great. That's what this lesson is about. And what does that mean to us today? Since we are the spiritual Israel of today, why is it important to us to know what it made Israel great? It's because it's what's going to make us great as well. What are these implications to us? So it's an exciting lesson as we explore, and we explore this question through the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, uh, from verse 1 to verse 9. So before we read uh, this part, let's set the scene a little bit. So the first three chapters of Deuteronomy were basically a history lesson that Moses gave the Israelites, reminding them uh, what God had done for them. And they just had reviewed this recent history, a reminder of what God had done for them, and the chapter starts with now, sort of like a therefore, thus, mm -hmm. because. 
So now, Israel, because what I have done for you, you must obey the following. And here we start, and I'm going to read fairly quickly these nine verses and then turn it over immediately to David so that he can start unpacking the first two verses for us. So let's read together. So here's Moses telling them, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live. And go in and possess the land, the land which the Lord God of your father is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Verse 5, surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Verse 7, for what great, great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. This is what we are looking at, the instructions for Moses. So without further ado, David unpack for us the, on Sunday's lesson, which is verses one and two. Thank you, Daniel, for setting up that standard and uh, setting uh, this beautiful setting so we can have some understanding of what is going on here. Sunday's um, title is Do Not Add or Take Away. In other words, do not change. What's interesting is this title is on Sunday. And we know what happened in the history about Sunday because the Sunday is the first day of the week and we know the worship has been changed about 2,000 years ago from Sabbath, Saturday to Sunday. So this um, title is really interesting and pertinent for Sunday. So when we look at this verse, um, you know, um, thank you for reading that. Um, the things that we need to focus on is God is uh, telling us to be careful, to listen, and to keep and observe. And because of that, we can live and possess. And Deuteronomy 12.32, I want to read that also. Deuteronomy 12.32 says, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. So what is Jesus actually saying to his people? What is God actually saying? He has given them a warning, and that warning is a command. He has commanded his people in how to keep his commandments. God is saying to us, let's pay attention. It is very important that you do pay attention because your life, your reputation depends on it. He wants us to obey him. It is not a simple obedience. It's a steadfast obedience, thick and thin. God wants us to neither add nor subtract from his law, his word. Because when we do that, we are in open rebellion with God. He also wants us to treasure, cherish his law, his word. Because he says, love the Lord. Now, if you look at Psalms 1, that Psalms 1 sets the standard of what blessing is when we keep the law of God. And Psalms 1 also tells us about the people who do not keep the law of God. When we have time, let's read that in our home. So why would anybody want to change God's law? He's our creator. He knows better. But, you know, we gave in to Satan's lies. Satan said, you have the knowledge of good and evil. And now use it as it fits in your eyes. See, Satan says we should know as well as God does about ourselves and as such we have the authority to change his law as it fits when we look at the book of judges when the israelites were going through 
nation building, the last verse of Book of Judges is interesting. It says, everyone did what is right in their sight because they had no king. Unfortunately, Israelites forgot that they had the king of kings, Jesus Christ. So they forgot about him. They ignored his instructions. And when they did that, they also, it was easier for them to change the law. We also want to change the law because we seek to exalt ourselves and use God's law as a passage, a right to exalt ourselves. We don't even believe sometimes in the unity that the law brings, and we also don't believe the sanctity of life that the law preserves. In fact, we, Adam and Eve did not believe when God said, you shall surely die when you disobey. You see, the problem of changing God's law is in our hearts. Human heart is in rebellion with God's law, our heart of stone. 1 Samuel 12, 14 to 15 says, Rebellion is breaking God's command. Matthew 15, 19 says, For, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts and everything that's evil. Moses said this very nicely, Numbers 15, 39. He says, It shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the land, um, uh, of the Lord to do them not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes which you are inclined to whore after. See in Daniel chapter 725 tells us exactly what happens to people when they believe Satan or to the kingdom. The little horn followed the example of Lucifer, spoke pompous words and changed Sabbath law uh, from Sabbath worship to Sunday worship. We also know that Early churches added uh, and subtracted different laws and rules and statues. That actually led to loss of hope and loss of eternal life for many people. In fact, just like the judges, the time after Jesus till 1844, people used God's law to sin, to be powerful, to oppress people. So when we compromise the law of God, then it becomes a snare, which is the first step to fall into sin. God says, don't let your heart compromise on my law. Exodus 34, 12. So Jesus was asked about tradition versus God's law. And Jesus said traditions are just that. They can be a snare. Traditions are man-made. It divides people into groups. In fact, Jesus said when, in, um, when you um, tell people to donate to the temple and use that as a requirement that can be fulfilled for the fifth commandment, you're actually using tradition to pretty much obliterate God's law. And that's not right. So um, tradition is actually makes worship sometimes meaningless. And we need to be very careful about our traditions. How about um, Christmas tradition? In Christmas, we buy a lot of things. We need to focus on people that need actual help. Remember, Christmas comes from a pa pagan tradition. Also, worshiping outside church on Sabbath and bringing the message to others sometimes is important because Jesus took the message to the Samaritan lady in Samaria, and um, it was done at the Jacob's Well. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we really can do that because we have the whole Sabbath day to worship God. And so we just, you know, when we look at all this, God's law, we really need to appreciate it. We need to realize that his law gives life. It is light to everybody. It serves as a mirror for all of us to repentance and to impartial judgment. It tells us what God expects and how he judges us all impartially. It reminds us that we are his people. We uh, have that uh, law helps us to actually realize that we need to be repentant so that we can be born of water and we also can be born of the Spirit by having the law of love in our heart. And so we need to really remember, without law, our words are just empty. But with God's law as our ornament, as our tassel, we are sealed for salvation. Let's accept the invitation of Jesus and truly love him by keeping his law in the purest form because God's wisdom is pure. Now I transition to Scott. Thank you, David. Um, so Monday's lesson, 
uh, we're talking about Baal of Peor. Now, Baal was the uh, sun god that was worshipped by a lot of the Phoenician peoples in, in the area of the Middle East at the time when um, God was returning Israel to the land of Canaan. Um, so it says in Deuteronomy 4, 3 and 4, the children of Israel are given a bit of a history lesson to function as a reminder of the past of whatever spiritual and practical truths that they ideally should learn from it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in Numbers 25, 1 to 15, uh, it says, Israel remained at Shittim. The people began to commit infidelity with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to sacrifice of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel became followers of Baal, of Peor, and the Lord was angry with Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill his men who have become followers of Baal of Peor. Then behold, the sons of Israel brought... Uh, one of the sons of Israel brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. Um, and then I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. So Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, rose up in the midst of the congregation, took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel in the inner room of his tent and pierced them both. And the man of Israel and the woman through the abdomen. So the plague of the sons of Israel was brought to a halt. But those who died from the plague were 24,000 in number. So, um, you know, th this seems kind of a, um, a little bit of a shocking story sort of to us as people coming from the 21st century when the love of Christ is emphasized, but the, the judgments of God are not really talked about too much in our current churches. Um, in fact, the Sabbath school lesson says, however uncomfortable we are with the stories of Israel wiping out some of the pagan nations around them, this account certainly helps explain the logic behind the command. Israel was to be a witness to the pagan nations around them of the true God, the only God. They were to be an example to show the worship of the true God was like. Instead, by adhering to the pagan gods around them, they often fell in outright rebellion against God. They were um, against the God whom they were to represent to the world. Through the phrase to commit harlotry often has spiritual meaning in Israel, in that Israel went after pagan gods and practices. In this case, the language suggests that there was sexual sinning, at least at first. Here again, Satan took advantage of fallen human nature, using the pagan women to seduce men who obviously allowed themselves to be seduced. Uh, no doubt, the act of physical harlotry degenerated into spiritual harlotry as well. The people eventually got caught up in the pagan worship in which Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, that is, somehow became attached to the false god and sacrificed to it. Despite everything they had been told, they were willing to throw it all away in the heat of passion. How could this have happened? Easily, by hardening their consequ uh, consciences against the first sin, the physical one, they were ripe for falling into the later one, the spiritual one, which must have been s Satan's ultimate goal. They had become debased, according to the text, and one man brought his Midianite woman to the camp right before Moses and before the other people who were weeping outside the tabernacles. So I know I wanted us to notice a progression here, which is um, it started off with friendship towards the world, and then it went on to having music and dancing or a festival. Then it went on to the physical act of immorality. Then it went on to idolatry, which then resulted in separation from God, and the consequence of that was death, as evidenced by the death of the um, 
Israelite man who had brought a harlot with him into the con into the congregation, um, and as well as the twenty four thousand that died. And there's a, a good commentary in Patriarchs and Prophet that kind of explains this whole um, scenario. And so I'll, I'll uh, read that now. So at first there was little intercourse between the Israelites and their heathen neighbors, but after a time, a Midianitish women began to steal into the camp. Their appearance excited no alarm, and so quietly were their plans conducted that the attention of Moses was not called to the matter. It was the object of these women and their association with the Hebrews to seduce them into the transgression of the law of God, to draw their attention to the heathen rites and customs, and lead them into idolatry. These motives were studiously concealed under a garb of friendship so that they were not suspected even by the guardians of the people. At Balaam's suggestion, a grand festival in honor of the gods was appointed by the king of Moab and it was secretly arranged that Bal Balaam should introduce the induce the Israelites to attend. He was regarded by them as a prophet of God and hence had little difficulty accomplishing his purpose. So I think that this is also a lesson for us, so I'll just quickly comment on that, that somebody who was once a prophet of God or somebody maybe today who has an honored position in the church, if they um, promote something that is against what God would say, we're not to listen to them, just like the Israelites should not have listened to Balaam but they used the fact that he had been a prophet of God as excusing uh, them to, to do whatever he was uh, enjoining them to do. So they ventured upon forbidden ground and were entangled in the snare of Satan. Beguiled by music and dancing and allured by the beauty of the heathen vestals, they cast off their fealty to Jehovah. As they united in mirth and feasting, indulgence and wine, beclouded their sense and broke down their barriers of self-control. Passion had full sway, and having defiled their consciences by lewdness, they were persuaded to bow down to idols. They offered sacrifice upon heathen altars and participated in the most degrading rites. It was not long before the poison spread like a deadly infection through the camp of Israel. Those who would not have been conquered by enemies in battle became were overcome by the wiles of heathen women. The people seemed to be infatuated. The rulers and the leading men were among the first to transgress, and so many people were guilty of the apostasy became national, and Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. When Moses was aroused to perceive the evil, the plots of their enemies had been so successful that not only were the Israelites participating in licentious worship at Mount Peor, but the heathen rites were coming to be observed in the camp of Israel. The aged leader uh, was filled with indignation and the wrath of God was kindled. Um, their iniquitous practices did for Israel what all enchantments of Balaam could not do. They separated them from God. By the swift coming judgments, the people were awakened to the enormity of their sin. A terrible pestilence broke out in the camp, to which tens of thousands speedily fell a prey. God had commanded the leaders of the apostasy to be put to death by the magistrates. This order was promptly obeyed. The offenders were slain, their bodies were hung up in the sight of all Israel, that the congregation, seeing the leader so severely dealt with, might have a deep sense of God's abhorrence of this wrath against them. Um, so then uh, the, I'll just conclude by saying that um, when Phineas acted in, in defense of God's honor, God was pleased with that, so he, he assigned the um, priesthood to, to remain to the family of Aaron and the family of uh, Phineas. So uh, the point is that in this case, Phineas made an uh, atonement for the whole congregation by um, stopping one man from his iniquitous practices. So sometimes God call, calls us to be 
stern rebukers of sin. Uh, and so we shouldn't neglect that part of our duty as well. So with that, we'll move on to the next. Actually, I was just thinking how magnanimous God really was because even by doing the plagues, only 24 died, 24,000 died. But really, if he would not have stopped, if he'd not done the plagues, this would have spread like a wildfire through the entire camp, and eventually they would have all died before they even entered the promised land. So they would have never made it. <laughs> um, so sometimes we, we look at uh, uh, these consequences and we think are oh, too stern, but really he stopped the death of all. Um, Tuesday's lesson is covering uh, one of the verses that we were, that you mentioned, uh, it's continuing, it's just verse 4. Mm -hmm. And it's titled, Cleave to your, the Lord your God. Now let's read the text where it's coming from, and then let's discuss it a little bit. So it's coming from Deuteronomy 3 and 4, which is exactly the portion that, he was co that the Scott was covering. And it says, it's, it's Moses telling them, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you, who held fast to the Lord your God, are alive today, every one of you. And in a, some of the translations, this, uh, it says, those of you who cleaved to the Lord your God. So there comes our title from today's lesson, Cleave to the Lord your God. So it's making a reference to those Israelites in the camp that did not participate and, and obeyed the Lord and the precepts of the Lord and did not participate in this practice that had happened. So it, that's the invitation to the Israelites. He, Moses is reminding them now of what had happened there and is telling them, those of you who have cleaved to the Lord, every one of you are alive today. And that's the invitation to them at this point in time to continue to cleave to the Lord, their God. And so is the invitation to us. Now, cleave, this word stands, when we think of this word, it's not a word that we use often nowadays. It's just uh, not that common. Mm -hmm. But we know what it means because we've all heard it in school and so on and so forth. It's not that foreign and that old and archaic that we don't understand it. It basically stands for the closest possible relationship like that of a husband and a wife. And um, we have a few references where this kind of terminology is used in the Bible so we can understand it. In Genesis 2.24, in the very beginning when the marriage was brought about, and uh, it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And it's the same terminology used, cleave, like uh, used in the translation here. And then in Job 19 with 20, uh, here is Job talking about his bones. He's talking that my bone clings to my skin and to my flesh. And it's like graphic picture. Um, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. He is so uh, emaciated from his terrible affliction to the point where his skin and the bone are just clinging to each other. So it's a very graphic together tied together. And then in Ruth, uh, we, we see this beautiful goodbye uh, between Orpah, one of the two daughter-in-laws of Ruth, but Ruth does not leave. And he says, then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So we see it's like Ruth would not let go. Hmm. Just, so we're not to let go of our God. Now, why cleave? Why should we cleave? In Jeremiah 13, 11, it's, uh, it says, For as sash, sash being like a ribbon, clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me. This is God talking. And he's caused the entire house of Israel and the entire house of Judah to cling to him, says the Lord that they may become my people for renown, for praise, and for glory, but they would not hear. So the Lord had asked Israel and Judah 
And we saw that through Moses, he did that too, to cling to him, and they have, he's asked them to do that because he wants them to become his people and for their own renown, for praise and for glory. That's really the reason. It's And who is to cling? Now, that's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lesson makes this very clear, and it's things that we don't really kind of process many times. We read fast and we don't stop. Yeah. But when it comes to clinging, it's not God clinging to us because he's giving us freedom. He is allowing us to make a choice. If he was clinging to us, we would not have that choice. We are to be the ones doing the clinging. He's inviting us to do the clinging, but we are to make that decision. The people of God are supposed to cling to him, and we are those people today. Yeah. We are. I, Daniel, am supposed to cling to God. I'm to cling to God. How, how do I cling to God? Hmm? Deuteronomy 11.22 tells us, For if you carefully keep all these commandments which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to hold fast to him. That's really how we cling. We determine that we're going to keep his commandments, and that we're going to love the Lord, walk in his ways, and hold fast to him. So it's like in this I love this text because yeah. it really has it all in it. It's telling us how, and then at the end, it's telling us that that means clinging, holding fast, clinging to him. So I must make a choice. I must make a decision. Will I truly be doing the clinging by myself? That's the question. Can I really keep these commandments by myself? Can I even love the Lord on my own? He provides the power as long as I decide purpose in my heart that I will obey, then the Lord will provide me the strength. Where do we find that? Jude one twenty four. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So he's the one that's able to keep me, Daniel, from stumbling and to present me faultless before the presence of the Lord. And then Deuteronomy 13.4 says, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And it's repeated. This, we've been reading all these in the Old Testament. But here's in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So he's going to provide a way of me to cling. I mean, I'm going to make the purpose decision, but he's going to provide for me the way to do that. The power. How essential is my clinging to God? How essential is your clinging to God? Deuteronomy 30, 19 with 20 tells us, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you Life and death. It's a matter of life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to give them. So he is our life. We are to cling to him. He is our um, and we're to obey his voice. So the message is clear. I'm going to wrap this up. Study his word, his voice. Follow his word and voice. What is his voice and word? The Bible. How can you follow something while turned with our back and going in the opposite direction? We can't. So we have to obey. We have to follow in the direction he directs. Otherwise, we couldn't follow him. What your eyes are fixed on is what you will follow. Worship and praise him. Thank you. Tim. That's a lot to, to just, just so much meaning in all these, this one little text. I'm going to turn it over to you to the next day. Thank you, Danielle, for really showing us what clinging means. Mm -hmm. Because the next title on Wednesday is the title of the Sabbath school lesson for this week also. For what nation is there? 
so great. It is what Daniel said, clinging to God. So let's go and, you know, Daniel, Deuteronomy 4, verse 5 to 9, but it's a long section, but let's read from 7 to 9. For what great nation is there that God so near to it? As the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him, and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children. So what makes a nation great? First and foremost, it's not the people, but it's God being Im among the people and people clinging or listening to God. That makes the nation great. Here, where I want you uh, all to focus on the on the on these um, words. The, the Israelites are a great nation because Lord God is giving the commands. He is directing them. He is letting them know what they should be doing. And he's also telling them how important it is to be obedient, not to forget. And also be campaign managers or campaign workers for God so that they can take the message of gospel to others. You see, this, um, this part of this Deuteronomy, it truly is the gospel message for the whole Bible. I mean, if you look at it, what makes earth the greatest nation because Jesus he was here he was here he brought himself down here and he showed God's character of love Jesus is saying my laws are universal unifying full of pure wisdom light and hope to all nations you must remember that always why would anyone want to believe in Israel if the wisdom of God is not in them if their statutes and ju judgments are not from God. So when we tinker with God's laws, judgments and commandments, we cannot represent God to others and take the gospel effectively to other people. Who wouldn't want to be part of a kingdom that follows God's statutes and commandments and his um, ordinances? Everybody, because it is impartial and full of love. Most importantly, the laws of God are the blessings from God to everyone. When we go to Genesis 12, 2, 3, we know why God has made Abraham a great nation. He says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And he says, I will bless those who bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing to others. See, the word blessing appears five times in Genesis 12, 2 to 3. See, the word bless is mentioned five times here. It's all about God's blessing. Isaiah 49, 6, God says, Is it too small of a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob? He gave us the greatest responsibility. He gave the Israelites the greatest responsibility among the pagan nations. He told them to be the light. He tells us, to be the light, to bring the eternal life of salvation in Jesus Christ, which is, in God's eyes, the greatest task of love for him, the greatest testimony of love for him. Let people see it, let our mind believe it, and let our heart desire it. This is the commandment that gave, God gave to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, to Noah, who preached life for 120 years, to Israelites, and now to us. It is God's task, not ours. But God is asking us to act on his behalf, which again is the greatest testimony to God by us. In Isaiah 60, 1 to 3, he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. God is saying, I will show myself to others through you. I have chosen you first, and now choose me and receive 
my seal. Take me to others so others can reap the same benefit because I am the God of the whole earth and all the people. Colossians 1.27 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. See, Jesus, our God, was with us. Our God is us in Jesus Christ. And what an amazing story that is. Now John 15.3 says, Because I have spoken to you, you're already clean. You see, when God speaks to someone, that means he already anointed that person. You spoke to Moses. He spoke to the Israelites. He spoke to the prophets. He spoke to, he came to Nebuchadnezzar in dreams. He can use anyone. So God has spoken to us now. We are chosen. It's in the Bible. It's in his testimony. It's everywhere. We, Seventh Adventist people, can be and must be that light. Why wait any longer? Jesus says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. You see, keeping the commandments is a sign of faith and love. And Jesus' love for God was his obedience to God's commandment. Let me repeat that. Jesus' love for God was his obedience to God's commandment. And, um, you know, at the end of, our, um, of uh, Wednesday, uh, there's uh, these verses were very interesting. Deuteronomy 4, verse 35 to 39. It's long verses, but oh, I wanted to summarize that. It's talking about God doing miracles, how he did so many miracles, and the things that he did for them and that nobody can do. And God is reminding them. This is very, very interesting because God really does not want us to have that type of faith where he has to do something for us to believe him. Sadly, God has to do miracles to make people believe him that he is God and that he keeps his word. Jesus performed miracles when he was here so people can believe but God prefers that we have faith without seeing, John 20, 29. And without faith, we know that it is impossible to please God, Hebrew eleven six. 6. So the question is, is our faith true? And if it is, then we will keep his law. We have no excuse because God has known the past and we are experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit now. If we truly know God, we will then know that he is coming soon and we have a great joy to do. Let's be the servants of the law, not the enforcers of the law. Let me repeat that. Let's be the servants of the law and not the enforcers. Let's not be legalists, but be evangelists who bring the love of Christ by serving the law. Only then law can be kept in its purest form. I thank you and I just want all of us to realize that we are part of this great nation of God and as such we must, must campaign for God and that campaign is fulfilled by keeping his law. Now I transition to Scott. So Thursday's lesson is called Your Wisdom and Understanding. And so this refers specifically to Deut Deuteronomy 4, 6. It says, so keep and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statues. Surely this is a great nation. Th th this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Um, so I think one interesting point to highlight in here in their wisdom and understanding is that Wisdom and understanding involves not only knowing God's laws, but also applying them or obeying them in our own lives. Um, it says Israel could have had the most wonderful systems of laws and rules and regulation as the world had ever seen, and in fact it did. But what good would it all be if Israel didn't follow it? Instead their w of their wisdom, 
and understanding came the real-time manifestation of God's laws in their lives. They were to live out the truths that the Lord had given them, so that, um, and they could do that only by obeying them. So one of the other things that kind of came to mind as I was reading that was, in the life of Christ, the people were saying, never a man spoke as this man spoke. And that was because Christ himself was the embodiment of all the truths that he spoke. So when you are the truth, then people will believe you. But if you merely speak the truth, but you act a lie, then you're giving an inconsistent message and then God can't use you. So in fact, the same message, and it's interesting that even the same words are used in the Proverbs um, chapter 1, verse 2. It says, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction and wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to produce, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. A man of understanding will ac acquire wise counsel, to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. So in other words, if you despise this, you're a fool. And so he, he doesn't mince words. Um, so it's also interesting, um, the commentary again from Patriarchs and Prophet I thought was very uh, revealing. So it says, um, now all these things happen unto them uh, for examples, for they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And that's a quote from 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12. Satan well knows the material with which he has to deal in the human heart. He knows, for he has studied with fiendish intensity for thousands of years the points most easily assailed in every character, and through successive generations he has wrought to overthrow the strongest men the princes of Israel, by the same temptations they were so successful at Baal Peor. All along, through all the ages, there are strewn the wrecks of character that have been stranded upon the rocks of sensual indulgence. As we approach the close of time, as the people of God stand upon the borders of the heavenly Canaan, Satan will, as of old, redouble his efforts to prevent them from entering the goodly land. He lays his snares for every soul. It is not the ignorant and uncultured merely that need to be guarded, for he will prepare temptations for those in the highest positions, in the most holy office, if he can lead them to pollute their souls, then he can destroy them, uh, destroy many. And he employs the same agent, agents as he employed 3,000 years ago, by worldly friendships, by the charms of beauty, by, the pleasure of, uh, by pleasure seeking, mirth, feasting, the wine cup, he tempts to the violation of the seventh commandment. And then Satan seduced Israel into licentiousness before leading them into idolatry. Those who will dishonor God's image and defile his temple in their own persons will not scruple at any dishonor to God and will gratify the desire of their depraved hearts. Sensual indulgence weakens the mind and debases the soul. The moral and intellectual powers are benumbed and paralyzed by the gratification of the animal propensities, and it is impossible for a slave of passion to realize the sacred obligation of the law of God, to appreciate the atonement, or to place a right value upon the soul. Goodness, purity, and truth, uh, reverence for God and the love for sacred things, all those holy affections and noble desires that link men to the heavenly world are consumed in fires of lust. The soul thus becomes blackened and desolate waste, the habitation of evil spirits and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Beings formed in the image of God are dragged down to the level of the brutes. And it says, by associating with idolaters and joining in their festivities, the Hebrews were led to transgress God's law and bring his judgments upon their nation. 
So now, by leading the followers of Christ to associate with the ungodly and unite their amusements to that of Satan, the most successful and alluring, uh, Satan is most successful in alluring them to sin. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean. God requires of his people now as a great a distinction from the world in customs and habits and principles as he required of Israel anciently. If they faithfully followed the teaching of his word, this distinction will exist. It cannot be otherwise. The warnings given to the Hebrews against assimilating with the heathen nation were not more direct or explicit than are those forbidding Christians to conform to the spirit and customs of the ungodly. Christ speaks to us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For friendship of the world is enmity of God, and whosoever therefore will be a, a friend um, of the world is the enemy of God. The followers of Christ are to separate themselves from sinners, choosing their society only where there is an opportunity to do good. We cannot be uh, too decided in shunning the company of those who exert an influence to draw us away from God. While we pray, lead us not into temptation, we are to shun temptation so far as possible. So we'll just end with that and we'll move on to the... Thank you, thank you, Scott. So we're reaching almost at the end. We just have our closing comments. Um, David, do you have a few words for us at the end? Yeah, you know, what a study, right? What a study. I mean, we're part of this nation that's everlasting. I wish everybody reads uh, from the book of Numbers because it is the gospel, because God is speaking. The world was divided. Jesus won, Satan lost. But Satan is always trying to hide that fact. He's trying to hide his character. He's also trying to tarnish God's character. Here we are, the campaigners, campaign managers for God. We are Christians, Adventists, and we can actually work for God. We need to represent God character, God's character to everybody. So let's campaign harder to save others. Thank you, David. Scott, you have a few parting uh, words. Yes. So wh one of the things that I was thinking is about the, the fact that sometimes I, I get to put into practice some of the things that we learn. So when uh, Sophie and Justin, my kids, were invited to a Halloween party, um, I, I decided to tell them that, no, this is Halloween is Satan's holiday, so we're not going to honor it by going to that event. But instead, we decided to do something among ourselves that would be fun for them, like play games and so forth. So, and I wanted to conclude with um, a couple more verses here. So it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, is the counsel of the wise man, for out of it are the issues of life. Uh, as a man thinketh, so is he. So in other words, I think we need to focus our minds and our efforts to do everything that is right because without making that our priority, I think it's easy to sway or move away from that. Thank you, Scott. So we've I've got a few thoughts that I need to share with you as we're wrapping up here. Um, God in, God's instructions through Moses in the beginning of Deuteronomy, which what we're looking at today from verses 1 through 9 in chapter 4, was, So now, Israel, because of what I've done for you, you must obey the statutes and the judgments. And we didn't, we've covered in previous quarters uh, the, the, what it, exactly the laws were that they had to keep. So just a brief reminder summary. What were these judgments that were outlined that Moses was referring to? Mm -hmm. The Ten Commandments, which, uh, as we know, the Ten Commandments, it's the religious and moral law, or as we know, the Decalogue. It's related to God and creation. It's all encompassing of his character and who he is and what he stands for. And that's for us to keep as well. The Dietary Laws of Leviticus which is interesting, people have a hard time placing those, but 
there is a very strong connection to creation to them. It's also related to creation. It's like there, it follows the same language, mm -hmm. words and stylistic expressions, like for example, beasts of the herbs, creeping animals after its kind, etc. The listing any animals in Leviticus 11, 2 and 8 follows the same sequence as in Genesis, like the six days of creation, animals of water, followed by animals of earth, air, animals of earth and reptiles. Also, in Genesis and Leviticus, the fact that humans are to exercise dominion over the animals and are created, and that humans are created in the image of God is also outlined in both Leviticus and in Genesis. So we can see the connection. It's a very strong connection to uh, creation in Leviticus. And I'm going to read Leviticus 11, verses 44 to 45. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. So it's that strong of a direction from God when they're to follow the, Le the Levitical laws, which is the laws of cleanliness. Neither, and neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping things that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. It's that important of a matter. So for both the Ten Commandments and the dietary laws, we can see the clear connection to creation and the image of God. Um, two types of other laws remain that were covered uh, in the books before. Uh, the ceremonial laws. Those are related to the temple and sacrifices, clearly pointing towards the sacrifice of Christ. Now, it was for them to keep because they were prior to Jesus coming on this earth and actually being sacrificed. But once Christ was sac sacrificed, they ceased as evidenced by the events that took place in the sanctuary immediately after Christ's death on the cross, like the tearing of the, uh, uh, cover, yeah. the veil and the destruction of, of the, the temple, so to speak, the sanctuary. And then the last uh, type of law, the circumstantial kind of laws, for example, laws concerning slaves and the ways to dress, to till the land, to organize and administer the city, were not designed to be observed forever. They were not of, uh, it was just for them organizational at that time. So those are the laws. We can see clearly the ones that would disappear, mm -hmm. the ones specific to their time in, in space of how they would, slaves, we don't have slaves today, and were not to have slaves, to till, how they were to till the land, how they were to organize, that could disappear. And also the ceremonial laws, because Christ obviously came and fulfilled that in his death. Mm -hmm. But the other laws still stand for us today. The ones connected to the Ten Commandments and the dietary laws, because they're connected to creation. And like the dietary laws, a lot of people like to get, do away with. But it, God said it so clearly, I, you shall be holy for I am holy. And it's in the body of that. So that summary is just a helpful part. I just wanted to go back. In fact, when we're looking at these laws, the, the thing that's delineating these laws that the Hebrews and we, we have in the Bible for us today were how different they were from the surrounding countries. Mm -hmm. They all referenced God. They all directed them to God and obey because of God. Um, they were given and spoken with authority, and they were just... For example, thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal. Even our laws today don't read like that. They are, they're like very convoluted and ca cause and effect kind of a writing. Absolutely. So that's what's different about the laws uh, in the Bible. One other thing that in wrapping up is that really struck me on, on the Thursday lesson that Scott was covering as I was preparing and kind of covering the lesson and looking and picking at your part, I just got struck on the fact that wisdom and understanding comes with obeying. Mm -hmm. It's not something we get ahead of time. It's like we purpose in our hearts to obey the Lord. He gives us the power and the strength to do it. And then we see the, the effect of that is getting understanding. Like as we obey, I could say that I understand the Sabbath differently and what the effect it has in my life after I've kept it for all these years. I didn't understand it before. And we can see it in Daniel. Daniel is a per perfect exa example, his life. He started out as a youth. He purposed in his heart to obey. So happens that it was dietary laws at first. And continuing with not 
bowing down and worshiping in images in, as in Daniel 2. He purposed in his heart and he followed through on his decision. God opened avenues for him to obey. It wasn't in his power and his strength, but God you know, opened up avenues. And there was apparent dead end for him everywhere he was going, but God provi provided a, like a, a way out. And as a result, he served under four different kings, reached the pinnacle. Sort of we can see through his Daniel obedience, God preserved him, blessed him with vigor and intellect. The glory of God, God's majesty and power was revealed in all of God, Daniel's prosperity. Mm. And it's sort of like that for us and all those that follow the Lord and obey the Lord. Once we purpose and we do sort of like Daniel follow through, God will provide the avenues, we'll get the understanding, we'll get the blessing. It all comes with the doing. And even to the point of sending uh, the covering cherub Gabriel who replaced Lucifer to explain the prophecies that da Daniel gave Absolutely. him. Absolutely. I mean, there's, we could go on for that forever. So I just have, I'd like to close with this invitation, which is the Deuteronomy 4-6 invitation. Mm -hmm. The same promise and invitation that is, was made to the Israelites is made to us and will be evident in our lives. Let us claim it. And here it goes. Deuteronomy 4.6, therefore, be careful to observe them. Mm -hmm. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in sight of the people who will hear all these statues and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. God will give us that wisdom and understanding as we do. It's time for our closing prayer. Um, we really enjoyed being having this lesson with you together. But uh, it's time to let you go on, on your way. So let's bow our heads and um, thank our Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom and the assurances and the lessons that you have given us today. We um, are just in awe as every time we open the word of God, we just see a little more and we are enlightened further. We are just amazed how you've provided the avenue, the direction for us, and then a way for us to achieve it. That you've given us such clear and concise directions where we just need to know that we're to obey. And such clear and concise laws like thou shall not kill and thou shall not, that we can't be confused. It's all simple and directive. And all you told us is to purpose in our hearts to follow you and that you'll provide the rest. Lord, help us so that we would purpose in our hearts and provide the strength and guidance just like you did for Daniel, for us and our loved ones, so that we would stand for you and cling to you. Give us the power to cling forever. Lord, we look forward to walking with you every day through eternity. Yes. Please take care of us and our loved ones through the rest of this Sabbath and the week to follow. In Jesus' precious name, we ask you and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath.